So I'm going to hand the floor over to Mr. Donald, and he's going to introduce our wonderful presenter tonight. Dennis Englander, yes. I have, I'm going to be reading this, so excuse me if I sound amateurish, but I'm not a public speaker, so. But I asked Stephanie if I could introduce my good friend, Dennis Englander. So I've gotten to know him quite well over the past 10 years or so. Dennis is a native San Francisco, a San Francisco and is married to a fine woman named Marcy. And Dennis has worked in the building trades and had a long career as a buyer for Channel Lumber, a large lumber wholesaler here in the Bay Area. Our own Terry Sussel has also known Dennis, maybe even longer than I have. But Terry and I were both chatting today about a really helpful friend Dennis has been to us both over the years. He's a great friend. So Dennis has been at it, photography, since the 1970s which means he started with film and obviously knows, knows his way around a dark room. But of course, in the last 15 or 20 years, he's become a master of the digital dark room, Photoshop. But I've always thought of Dennis as a street photographer. He's involved, of course, with the San Francisco Street Photographers Facebook group and the others. But take a look. And I think you will also see that his street photography carries over into the way he approaches his travel images. Mm -hmm. Tonight we are in for a treat and I've gotten to get a peek at what he's gonna be presenting here tonight. We'll be traveling through Italy, France, China, Japan, and a bit close to home, San Francisco. But again, keep your eyes open because we will see a lot of street photography in his travels. Dennis also has some good tricks for capturing people at work in different cultures, usually in the most incredible settings. Dennis will be explaining some of his techniques as he goes. He has some good tips about composition and how our eyes work. You'll see just how strong and impactful his compositions are. And of course, you'll see the strong leading lines in his images. They're hard to miss. So without further delay and zoom, 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 I give you my good friend and photo colleague, Dennis Englander. Yay. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Okay, so should we go right into the share screen and get the slide going? Why not, right? I might suggest everybody uh, mute. Huh. Okay. All set. Okay. All righty. So <clears throat> this is uh, taken in uh, Zion National uh, Forest. And uh, we were on a road trip. Let's get the you will find some fade-ins that I've presented on purpose as leading into uh, different segments. And I'm bringing you into the Alps right now. This is on the French side of the Alps. Oops, went a little too quick. Okay. This is ANSI. That used to be a prison of all things. Can you imagine? <laughs> Pretty crazy. It's in the Savoie region of France. Huh. This is also in Savoie. And this was the first snow, the first day of snow on our trip to the Savo region to visit our newborn grandson, our first grandchild lived in this area. So there we were to see him. And uh, this is in the town of Chambéry. I get a kick out of this one as a street photography because um, our photograph 
because of the way that the the woman is shepherding the child you see it's like move along nothing to see here and the young boy is obviously enjoying himself as well traditionally the weekend lunch um, in this town of Chambry, you'll find that most every weekend, very active, uh, open market. Unfortunately, they have um, Chasseur d'Alpin as a French mountain troop with live ammunition walking through the town of Chambry in a uh, to control any terrorist type of activities uh, that might start up. I wanted to take this shot uh, just to isolate on the figure, not so much the face of the figure, but the suspense is being broadcast by his hand and his fingers ready and one just behind him as well. This is a group from uh, the Middle East that were visiting this region uh, for mountaineering uh, tactics. Of course, uh, soccer is big over there. And like Donald was saying, you know, the lines tell a lot. Um, I was looking to <clears throat> hit this one just as the ball was in play. This shot I took in, 20, in uh, uh, 2009 during a uh, Tour de France. It was a leg that goes through the Alpine region. It's a very tough mountainous leg for those riders. And here they come up the hill. This fellow with the water bottle, that's Lance Armstrong from the United States. He was the only one with black uh, socks. My son-in-law, who's in this picture with our grandson, they're both living in France. He told me, watch for Lance Armstrong. He'll be the one with the black socks. So I mixed it up with a close shot to show the handoff from the support team to the riders with their water bottles. That's a water bottle handoff. I almost missed out on catching, uh, catching any of this because I just brought a Nikon D90 that I hadn't used before. And I wasn't used to, the, to where it was focusing, uh, multi-point focusing, but I finally got it figured out. This shot is taken through the underside of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, 1972. Up above here, that's the, um, that's the carriage that brings you up you know, to the upper stages, to the upper platforms. And I don't know if you remember, but the Eiffel Tower was supposed to be just a temporary structure. So can you imagine putting all this kind of stuff together for a temporary thing as a world trade, uh, a world's fair? Temporary, it's similar to how we had a temporary structure down at our Marina Green for a World Fair. I guess that's the way they do things. Uh, but anyway, this is the Eiffel Tower looking up from below and straight up. This is Pé Rouge. This is in the Savoie region. Uh, I really enjoy the, the stonework and the cobblestones and it's, a, it's an, old, an old village. Uh, here's one that, uh, as Don mentioned, uh, as a tip, uh, this shot I took while standing down in the, in the street, uh, looking up at the building. Now, one would think that I was taking this from directly across the street at the same level as the middle floor, but I'm not. I'm way down below, which would obviously present a terrible perspective uh, distortion. And I don't know if you're familiar with tilts and swings on folder ca cameras, but you can move the lens around to create a, a perspective control. This has been perspectively controlled 
or adjusted uh, in Lightroom. So it's to show that you can do this type of thing where you, I mean, it's not absolutely perfect. There's a little bit, a little wide margin on the lower right hand corner that it's lost it a little bit. But, uh, and the other thing that I like to call attention to in photography, and that's something called the puncton, which is that little red, you see this little red base or something that's in that window. Uh, it's, it's a feature that you might want to look for in your own photographs to tie into your photographs as a, a little bit of eye candy that makes a viewer swing through, through the image. Um, is to have just a small, and it makes a difference. Uh, it's typically thought of as the image is different if you take it out of the image. So that's just a little something there, punctum, punctum. This is in Stockholm, Sweden, and it's very vivid. I'll give you that. It's, it's vibrant, it's, it's almost garish, but I processed this one and I shot it on purpose to capture the flavor of those almost day glow psychedelic era uh, wall hangers. And I thought, good, let's just, let's just punch it all the way up and keep it in theme. Uh, and so that's what I did. Uh, Stockholm is a lovely town or city and it's full of all kinds of interesting things to look at. And in terms of telling a story, I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe these folks just got off of this one right here, sitting in the harbor, and they're just discussing their, their travel plans. This one, uh, I took this shot on purpose the way it, it shows this anchor point here uh, to pull the eye to this point and then follow this leading eye onto the deck and then this leading eye, uh, the leading lines here to push you into the sky. That's a natural sky. These, these are not, I don't do much alteration in terms of adding other scenery, you know, composite stuff. I do, I do it, but I'll let you know when it happens, <laughs> okay? Uh, so th this is a real event. This is in uh, Scotland, Edinburgh. And my shot here is to say, you know, do whatever you have to do to get the shot. Don't worry about others, you know, dance like nobody's watching. Uh, just do your own thing, get out there and don't worry about what others might be thinking about you as you do your thing. These people I do not know, um, it's in Scotland, but I recognized his look and I recognized her look the expressions, you might say. Uh, and so I decided to take a picture and capture their expressions as they were, I don't know, warming up to each other might be a term. Uh, now this is, uh, I'm gonna show you four images. This is the first of four. It has to do with my approach in street photography. How do I get close to people? How do I, managed to breach that invisible barrier of should I or shouldn't I. So I come in silently and I take this fellow's photograph and as expected, at some point, he notices me, okay? Fair enough. So I take this shot of him and I start to communicate, you know, visually with a smile and kind of a thank you and how things doing and, and he gets all happy and I take this shot of him. Uh, and then to further the rapport, I take a shot of what he is doing, what he's looking at. He's painting this scene, um, looking down the street, you know, from uh, Edinburgh Castle. Uh, and it, it kind of is to say, if a person notices you, don't freak out, just, go with the flow and, and make contact, take an interest in what they're doing, show that you're interested and don't, and show that you're not a threat. Um, you know, it's very human, it, it works. I, in all of my years of taking pictures since the seventies, 
and a lot of them were street. I've only been waved off maybe five times, and that's in 72. So we're talking, what, basically 50 years? Uh, one every 10 years? That's not a bad, <laughs> not a bad score, is it? It's worth it. It's worth uh, taking the chance. Uh, I had purchased and brought along a 12 millimeter Voigtlander uh, Prime to mount on my Sony uh, A7 II. I did that knowingly, wanting to be able to take distorted shots of you know heavy structures that I anticipated seeing in Scotland. This is one Episcopal church. And I was glad that it was just as heavy as I thought I might find. And with this distortion offered by the 12 millimeter lens, what I'm trying to do here is to emphasize the overarching, uh, what would you say, the overarching presence of the church in that community and how it draws in the community into that church. If you see them, again, distortions being pulled like magnetized into the church with this overreaching, you see it's, it just embodies it. I mean, it's a, draws in. And the sky, that's a real sky. I didn't, I didn't Photoshop that in. That is, that is the somber look, you know? So I took advantage of it as well. This is in, and with architecture, especially in churches, as you know, the vaulted ceilings are designed to make you look heaven, you know, up, upward toward heaven, they draw your eye. And that's, that's leading line basics applied in architecture on purpose, especially when it comes to uh, uh, church construction. So it's geared for that. We're coming to a transition here. Okay, on a train going to Spain, out of leaving France and going toward Granada, uh, you know, you've got hours, hours on a train, and I'm just sitting there twiddling my thumbs, enjoying the view, but I thought, you know, let me try a little bit of in-camera motion stuff. So this is a rack focus. Uh, the, the train is barreling along at, you know, 180 miles an hour, and I'm centered on this view, but I've got a telephoto lens. And so I'm twisting the lens as I'm, you know, shooting in a duration shot. And that's what, you know, just blows blows out the, the vision as you see it here. So rack focusing, you'll see some more of that. I have two others that you can see that explains it. And here's another one from the railroad. I looked up this ACAB, I was curious what the urban uh, connotation of that, and that's all cops are bad, <laughs> which is, I mean, on the way to Spain, you, you know, can you imagine how does that work? I mean, how do they pick up on that? Okay, transition into Shanghai. This is uh, the Pudong district. It's across the, the Wangpu River that runs and divides the Pudong district, which is all essentially modern, uh, away from the Bund, which is uh, a word for dock. So there was a, a loading dock alongside this river that's at the end of Shanghai uh, city. And then this is on the other side. So this all, my, and as a former builder, I was just drawn aghast by, where do you start to build something like this? I mean, they just go nuts with, with all kinds of crazy cantilevers and just wild stuff. This is more traditional. These are roof tiles on top of the Forbidden Palace in Beijing. Um, I was lucky to get a vantage point where I could take this because I was interested in, in that assembly. Uh, so yeah, roof tiles. And this is in that forbidden city. And this would be what the type of roof, roof, roofing that you're, you're seeing in that last shot. This is uh, in the summer palace of the forbidden city uh, in Beijing, um, really uh, a beautiful, just to be able to go through that was uh, 
a life experience. I never thought I'd be in China. You know, you see it in National Geographics, and then one day you're there. This is a shot taken in a hutong, which is a, a community, close-knit community, like a warren, sometimes described as a warren, where you have uh, alleyways that lead off into different uh, residences. Um, it, again, uh, similar, same, same locale. But what I liked about this one is multiple points of lighting. You have a light coming in from the top. You got a light coming in off to the left. You have a light coming in from behind me. So multiple points of light that are illuminating different surfaces all at one time, I thought was a, a nice play to try to capture. Okay. And we do a refresh here to go to, again, Shanghai. Once again, street photography, especially in Shanghai. People are just too busy doing their what they have to do to make their living, just, just living. And they don't care that you're there. They could care less that you're there. I mean, I got within tapping this guy's shoulder distance, and they just, you know, just doing their own thing. And imagine the freedom to do what they're doing, yeah, you wouldn't see this in San Francisco on the sidewalk in the middle of the street, that's just not allowed, right? So they do have a lot of commercial freedom over there to, to just do their own thing, I must say. Yeah, it's just the mom and pop bicycle repair zone. This cobbler I took from across the street and then uh, cropped and zoom in. I took it, I was noticing, uh, his hands, my hands through the trade years that I put in had similar scars and the broken fingertip and all that. And I was just fascinated. Hands always draw my attention because I know, I know the feeling of these, of these scars. Okay. I know what happened. <laughs> I mean, I can feel them just looking at it. So, but uh, anyway, I do enjoy seeing hands up close because it represents work. And I think that needs to be respected. Okay, in Shanghai, they were doing massive uh, restoration. They were tearing down whole, imagine a zip code, okay? Taking that all down and putting up modern structures, getting ready for uh, new population sizes. When we were there, it was the first time we were there in 2010, population I believe was around 16 million. In 2013, it had grown to 23 million. And they were sizing up for 30 million. So they're changing their power, power distribution poles and all the rest of it. And I call this shot Futures Wake because there's a, a futuristic building going up at the far end of the shot. And it's just leaving a, a, a shambles in its wake, the modernization as it tears through these, these old districts. Here's another view of, of an area that's under reconstruction, uh, just tearing the place apart. I call this one the silent witness. I don't know if you can see that character in the, over here in the corner. And I was struck by this figure in the midst of all this debris. I think, wow, you know, it really said a lot to me about how the rest of the people must be viewing this taking place because they've been offered settlements and some didn't like it and it get pushed out. You get the absurd, you know, the, it's just crazy. Things go on in, in Shanghai and other, other cities there that are just, they're mind blowing. You know, these people just do what they got to do to do their work. And uh, it's astounding. Taken from across a canal uh, in a water town, uh, the compression of hubbub activity it's just mind boggling at times. Um, there's just so much happening that it's like, you know, where do you start? And so I wanted to catch that. And then as we leave a temple area, as the day is getting on and the sun is going low, I was able to catch this sunlit uh, end of day food stall, just um, 
it's just a nice to me a nice image you know just the food and the people and the, the ambiance this was taken in shanghai in what used to be a um uh antique a place for people to sell antiques a whole neighborhood uh you know three or four blocks of just antiques mixed in with uh newfound kind of things and so you have to be careful what was antique and what is reproduction uh so i just you know walking down that street full of this stuff i i took a liking to this shot because of the the imagery the the young lady and then the the older style of Shanghai um, mixed in together. Speaking of street, street fair, street food, uh, my daughter who lived in Shanghai for six years told me that this is all gone, that they don't do much uh, street food anymore. That was as of a few years ago. You can still you can get this yao chou kuai these bread type things here in the city anyway in uh, places that serve dim sum they very often have this kind of a thing and the food is delicious I mean street food is hard to beat because they do it all day long every day of the week right and uh, so just get in line with the locals and you can't go wrong this is in the French Quarter of Shanghai. Everybody getting ready to close shop and go home. Last looks through the windows. Kind of like this. And the day ends and they go to the metro to go home. And I was astounded at how clean this metro system is. And it was relatively new when we were there. They just finished like in months they put together whole metro systems i mean just incredible uh when they get to going and they don't waste time they they blast away you know 24 7 make it happen they hire a lot of people for street cleaning stuff i mean you see street cleaners everywhere that's so i guess what's how they deal with uh, unemployment we're in japan this is in kyoto in a temple on the temple grounds and these tori columns i found out uh those are like billboards they're actually put up in, by commercial enterprises uh, along with funding to help support these temples and parks and things of that sort so it's pretty interesting and of course you can walk through them and you get this interesting shadow light and this is a contra jour against the light shot at a temple in uh, Kyoto. I had just come up the hill and made the turn on my left and I spot this and I just, you know, run and gun, get the camera up and take a shot. Um, you never know when it's going to happen. So you, you just kind of have to get ready and be surprised. This is in Narwa. Those are daikon radishes. What I like about this is the warmth of the tones in the shot mixed in with the the brights and the just the people, the layout, the motion, the story, the what's going on. Railroad station, uh, looking up into the ceiling that had this remarkable uh, structure. It's talking about my spectrum again of photography, you know, getting into graphic uh, abstract stuff, like the lines in this mall uh, in Japan. Uh, they, in Japan, I found that they're, they're really up on using graphics in their uh, architecture, you know, graphic type representations. This is a railroad conductor in a train that we were going on in, uh, in Kyoto to the temple area and we're entering a tunnel. So behind him, it's all that dark tunnel, but the light is ambient light coming in from the entrance to the tunnel. And I was lucky enough that it, it just lit him up so well uh, in a portrait type studio lighting almost, no flash. I don't, I rarely use flash. flash. 
It's one of my favorite uh, portrait type shots. This is a, a car in motion, a metro car in motion. Um, and the interesting thing that I found about this is you've got, look at the blur on the left and the blur on the right, and yet you've got this guy in perfect focus in the middle. You know, how does that happen? What are the physics involved? I think I was panning on his face and auto-focusing, because I, I use back button focus. And uh, so it just came out this way. Sort of Damocles, this fellow here with the, the gallery behind him waiting on a decision what to do with these people. So it's, it's a play on visuals. Sort of Damocles is, uh, you, you may know the story. I won't bore you with it. This is Beja, Portugal, an old town. It's up on a 900 some odd foot of elevation. It dates way back to the BCs. It's in Portugal and um, it's a very unique place to visit. And it's surprisingly large. It's uh, as a city, it's uh, 442 square miles. I was floored when I saw that. You know, here we are in San Francisco, about 49 square miles. And this thing is huge as a, as a town, but it appears and it feels so small because you're on the top of a hill and there's vast lowlands uh, that surround the hill and it's, you know, agricultural. Um, so, but these old types of buildings are pretty unique. This is Beja again, uh, to show, you know, the styles are just, they just come from ages old. This is in uh, Firenze or uh, Florence, Italy, the Domo. And the tough part about this shot is it's right up against the street. There's virtually very little sidewalk and it's very hard to catch a shot of this thing unless you back way up and then you get into this narrow, narrow alleyway. But the people are down below here that I left them in there for the scale. In the past, I would have been upset that there were people there and I would have waited for hours to, <laughs> until they all left. But now I enjoy having them as at least a, an item of scale, if not interest. And this is in Venice. I got a kick out of this uh, just because. And here we are in SoCal on a climbing wall structure. Again, people for scale and just the overall crazy lines going on and the, the eye candy of all these grab, grab uh, hook positions. And uh, you got to have a bridge shot, you know, if you don't have Golden Gate Bridge in your album, you're, you're a miss. So here's my bridge shot. And a shot of the Balkutha taken from deck level with, again, a lot of leading lines and drawing the eye, you know, and that sort of thing. So don't be afraid to take shots from way down low. Uh, it works. On occasion, it works. San Francisco Mission District, Clarion Alley, uh, full of murals. Um, Clement Street, San Francisco, uh, selling ducks, duck meat, you know. Fisherman's Wharf, I got a kick of this is an old shot. I got a kick out of these guys with the shadows um, dancing to, you can't see this person, but he's, he's playing drums and stuff. So it's just street motion. Here's a 72s scan from one of my black and white negatives that I didn't know. I should have used better quality water to wash it with the negative. Uh, we had good old fashioned iron pipes. And so there was rust and corrosion <clears throat> elements in the water, which left a patina that when I post processed this shot after scanning the black and white negative, you can't see this tone on the black and white negative with your naked eye. But 
Lightroom saw it and they presented the colors to me. I thought, you know, well, why not keep it? <laughs> but it's a warning when you're dealing with black and white film and you're self-processing, make sure you wash it well with good water. Otherwise you're likely to find yourself with patina and you can, you know, I can take that out. I can filter out all color in Lightroom and make this just black and white standard gray tones. But just as an illustration, I think it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. This was maybe one of my first rolls of film uh, back in the 70s that I self-processed, but a first roll of film uh, down at the uh, Fisherman's Wharf where they sell uh, crab and that sort of thing. You know, you walk by street food and these fellows work there also. I had taken a liking to uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson in street photography. And so I was kind of in my head, you know, working, working those kind of angles. Um, and so that's how it turned out, just using that kind of an eye. My eye is totally different now and I miss it. I miss that earlier look, um, but that's how it goes. Friends of the library, looking at books. And to add again to spectrum, um, I shoot what grabs my eye at the time. So it could be something like this with just lines and a graphical kind of impact shot. Um, so I'm all over the place, you know, BBs on a plate. And here's another one coming up. Again, graphic lines, uh, colors, hues, tints, texture, um, you know, juxtapositions. Um, just make it all happen. Go for it. Stairs. As a builder, I was always fascinated with stairs. I mean, that's really incredible. Uh, laying out stairs and seeing them get together is, is really remarkable. These go up to uh, Fort Mason on the parking lot uh, down below. And uh, Fort Point, again, structure as a builder, I was you know fascinated with what this put together. I look at these things and I say, how in the heck did they do that? You know, <laughs> it's a lot of work. But uh, the lighting and the, the tones, uh, when you walk through there, it's really phenomenal. This is at the Presidio, San Francisco. Uh, and I thought that this was an interesting thing, being that that was a former military base. And it's futures without violence. It's an interesting, uh, an interesting note to me. Uh, and this was on Memorial Day taken. Again, um, down at Fort Point with the flag twisted around the pole. So yeah, country's getting twisted around a bit. Again, in that same fort, uh, Donald has done this, Donald Kenny's done this type of shot. This is a remarkable hallway. It just stretches forever. And there are all these rooms off to each side. I mean, you can only, you can barely see how many different rooms and each one has windows that cast light in from the side. And if you get to the far end and look back toward this direction, it's, the arches are different. So you get a different line to it altogether. And in this case, you don't want people in the shot, or at least I don't. So yeah, you have to kind of stand around and wait and you know grab it when the opportunity lends itself to get a clear shot without people. Let's see, where are we going next? What kind of shot? Okay. So here we have again, rack focusing, rolling gate bridge, 30 second exposure tripod mount, no image stabilization when you're on a uh, tripod. And I'm just, turning the telephoto lens to its focusing range as I'm on tripod, you know, gently turning that thing uh, during the duration. So, so it's 
call it experimental shooting, okay? Uh, just to show what that effect does. And similarly, I did another one from the same viewpoint, only this time in the process of the shot, I moved the camera on the tripod mount, let it swing up into a different, you know, from horizontal to vertical positioning. So just sweeping that arc at, in that 30 second time frame while spinning the telephoto focus ring uh, creates some kind of crazy light light patterns. Uh, and especially at night, you know, it's, it's just a fun thing to do. You, you don't always know what it's gonna turn out to be until you, until you chimp it and take a look. In the belly of the Jeremiah O'Brien, uh, this was a merchant ship that was used in the Normandy uh, invasion, World War II. And this ship made it back for the 50th anniversary in 1994. Uh, I knew some of the fellows that were on this, uh, getting it ready to go, but to think that it made it after all those years, because it came out in the, in the 40, like 43, so it's an old ship. And those are the boilers. Uh, for the steam power. But can you imagine putting something like this together? It just these things just blow my mind when it's, when I look at things that that people have made, you know, it's just it's astounding. You know this area, Muir Woods. Um, I've been there a few times and I enjoy I enjoy doing landscape. Again, it's you know, it's it's my wide spectrum. I just enjoy all of it. If it catches my eye, I like to make a memory out of it and try to do some justice with it. Again, Muir Woods. Let's see. And a transition. So here I'm shooting through the front windshield while my son is driving and the sky is just threatening like crazy. Again, this natural sky, I'm not Photoshopping that in. And we're on our way to Mount Zion um, or Zion National Park in uh, Utah, where we were heading when this presented itself. When I see things like this, I like to play, you know, songs from, you know, the Moody Blues or something, you know, uh, nights in white satin, you know, <laughs> really sentiment that uh, type music. This is a ranch in uh, uh, Montana. Leading lines, sweeping curves, Idaho through the front windshield, 65 miles an hour. And you see a, an image like this, you know, a triplet. These are all the same trucking. I've tried to get a hold of this player. I don't think they're around anymore. <laughs> but, um, you know, that shots just kind of present themselves and they may or may not be to everyone's liking. Of course not. But, you know, I was working also for a drayage company. So freight to me is a remarkable thing, you know, logistics of freight. And when you're in the passenger seat and they're blocking your view, you take a picture of them. <laughs> so this is some, of course, earth moving equipment, probably going to the oil shale fields uh, up north. And here's another one that was blocking my view as we drove by and couldn't see out <laughs> over the, the landscape. So I said, okay, I'll take a picture of this. You know, it's right in my face. Uh, doorknob height to the car. So just uh, take what you have, make something. Took this one in Solvang, California's Corvette. Again, I was interested in the, in the lines and the, just the composition of it. My daughter down at the shoe, she does yoga and Pilates and dance and uh, she was putting together a, her own site. So I said, okay, I'll take some pictures of you. We'll just go down to the beach and 
take a shot or two. Now, I know that many of you enjoy taking pictures of flowers, and this is a staged shot that I took in my house. It's an indoor shot. I'm calling your attention to this because it's side lit from a window. So that's where the lighting's coming from. It's just ambient light coming through a window. But I've staged this plant in front of a computer monitor that is turned off, which gives me that jet black background. And it's a technique using black behind flowers that, that I took note of when I was a long time ago delivering medicine. And I happened to be delivering to a professional photographer who was in his studio using a black card behind flowers. And you could see immediately that the difference is that it allows the color to just pop without any other distraction. Okay, you don't have the wind. You don't have ratty looking leaves and bottle caps and litter and all the rest of it. So my suggestion for those that are interested, bring a black card or black something and put it behind you know, something that's interesting uh, to eliminate all that background clutter so that your main subject can really, you know, take the stage. And um, some like it and some don't, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's worth it. Because I know I've taken pictures of flowers in the wind. Oh my gosh, it's tough. And there are times when, you know, there's just, there's junk behind there, you know, they're just a mess. And what do you do? You know, you're gonna try to mask all that out while you're post-processing. That's a lot of work to mask out something like this. You know, so say, save yourself the trouble, just put a black background there or a white one, whatever you choose. So that's just a little, a little tip. In a similar setting, this was the same day, the same position, black screen behind it, not a turned on monitor, just computer is off and it's just to give that jet black without any distraction and it's just side lit from the window no flash no other lighting okay as this fades to vineyard leaves in Hillsburg uh, as they change color This is Pescadero. Uh, the tip here is this was post-processed. It was a color shot that I converted to black and white. But before converting it to black and white, I saturated the sky to full, as much blue as I could put in there. Okay, so it was a dark blue sky, uh, just, you know, just extreme saturation, knowing that when I converted to black and white, the sky would go black. Uh, surrounding areas that are well lit by the sun including the clouds, would present the look that we used to achieve in the darkroom days of black and white film using a red, fil a red filter lens, you know, a lens, a red filter, glass filter on the, on the lens itself so that when you would take a shot and develop it, you would get this kind of uh, contrast. Okay, so I was trying to do that just out of remembrance of the old black and white days shooting with a red filter. Uh, sometimes when you use uh, polarizing, uh, you can get this also. But anyway, so dark saturation blue, convert to black and white, you get a really dark sky, you get some dramatic contrast, it's just, just for fun. This is taken in a bar called the Saloon in uh, North Beach. Um, you know, just a, a shot for flavor. Um, here's another intentional camera motion or ICM uh, photo that I took uh, in Palm Springs. The wiggles that you see, that's, that is the motion that I imparted to the camera. I'm moving the camera on purpose in that to create the illusion, you might say, of these beasts, you know, radiating radiating heat or something. Um, and you don't move it a lot and you don't have to have a real long shutter speed, um, but it does 
it does offer a, a trick. Uh, Roxanne Overton on Facebook is a master at this. Roxanne Overton, you might want to look her up someday on Facebook. She's She's got the technique down pat. So what is beauty? Here we've got orchids that have seen their day. And uh, they're just there and I figure, well, let's remember them as they pass along. And they pass along into yet another realm. And there's still something there to be seen and worth capturing in my view, my opinion. Now, what is beauty? Uh, it's in the eye of the beholder, they say, right? But it's to say, you know, try different things with your shots. You know, convert color to black and white and be surprised. SFO, walking back to the parking lot, I noticed these two buildings with just the slimmest of margin between them. Uh, so I took it, you know, primarily for just perspective, convergence, uh, structure, mood, lighting. This is a very early shot of mine. This is probably one of the earliest experimental, I don't know what it is, type of shot taken down a four point. Um, the hand, that's my hand, and it's kind of like a trying to escape type of thing. It's just, you know, this one's taken in San Francisco going up to Turtle Hill. There's a set of stairs that go up to that Central Park, or that Central Central View Park, I think they call it. It's way up on high. It's a nice panoramic view, by the way. Uh, it's off of Noriega. Uh, at the top of Noriega, you go up these stairs and then it meanders up a, a, a hill. You, go up those stairs and yet more stairs and then some more stairs, you come to these stairs. <laughs> and this is taken with a vintage camera on uh, 120 film, self-processed, very granular. And there's a San Francisco Museum of uh, Modern Art. And I got a kick out of this guy. He looks like he just came out of this, <laughs> this uh, warp tunnel with his shirt mimicking something of the same sort of graphic street shot. Anybody know what kind of camera that is? I would say that's uh, a Sony RX100 because I have one. And he's taking street pictures, trying to be incognito, but I noticed them. This is in the Mission District. In the Dion Museum, I see these fellows standing there looking at this bare wall and I thought, really? And this said, uh, criminal science investigators. So I'm thinking, well, maybe they're looking for a lost picture or stolen, a stolen picture or something. I just caught my eye. Again, the San Francisco Museum, Museum of Modern Art, looking out at the city, these people, I thought that was an interesting perspective here they are in a museum but they're looking out at the city and it's a dramatic view and when you're when you're there uh, overlooking the sea like this it, it, it does grab your attention and this fellow down in the, in the mission district uh, Terry we were together on this walk I don't know if you remember that that uh, that photo shoot walk we did with Mike Kirshner and you and uh, I think David Luigi was with us. Um, but I came across this scene that and the guy looks totally per perplexed. Like, you know, he's looking down, he's like, what the, <laughs> you know? I thought it was kind of funny. And that's the end of the show, ladies and gentlemen. And that's me back in the seventies, taking a selfie with a tripod mounted Yashica Mat 124G that I bought at a pawn shop for $25 and found out that it had a light leak. Um, so I'm just, just waiting for that shutter to fire off. I have it on, on the time shutter release. 
And uh, so, yeah, it's been a lot of years. I say 47 years here because uh, I haven't been out shooting for, for a while now uh, due to COVID. I've tried to keep a very low profile away from people and staying home way too much. Self-isolation. I can't afford to get sick. I, my lungs have gone through five or six bouts of pneumonia. So I'm a prime target for anything that's going to take out the lungs. Uh, so I have to be very cautious. So anyway, that is it. There's my website, uh, Smug Mug, where you can find more shots if you're interested. And um, I think we so have time for some Q and A if people want to ask some questions. I have one. Um, can you speak a little more of? You were talking about some lens that like bends or oh. Something like that. So you're getting different perspectives. Can you talk yeah. a little more about that kind of lens? Sure. You know, you have what they call prime lenses, which are only one focal length, like a 50 millimeter lens, right? And so you're not going to be able to zoom with a 50 millimeter lens if it's a prime. But you can zoom with a telephoto lens, right? That yeah. will go anywhere from, you know, 25 millimeter up to 70 or 80 millimeter or beyond. And so <clears throat> what I do when I'm using a telephoto like that in a 30 second exposure tripod mounted, I will spin that focusing. Oh, that, okay, that that's what you're talking ring. about. Yeah, so that it goes okay. in and out of in and out of zoom, okay? Just like my finger. Oh. Doing. Okay. I and know. so that's been coined uh, rack focusing because okay. you're focusing through the <clears throat> rack of possibilities. And you get those dramatic lines like that. Thanks that was cool. Question. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Dennis, I, I, I have seen so much of your work over the years. And today you had a whole fresh new set of stuff. That I'm very appreciative. Well, I love you. how you get into the thought process yeah. on your images. That It's more than just an, a capture of an image. It's a thought process that goes behind it. Mm -hmm. um i think that's the making of an artist very thank very good you. thank you yeah again roxanne overton wrote a book uh it's available on amazon called uh, contemplative photography and um she does a remarkable job of uh self self critique okay if you follow she also has a book on that how to self critique your own photos because I know feedback is extremely hard to come by uh, over the many years on Facebook and with different you know groups that I belong to uh, you don't often get feedback and when you do you know it's a like or uh, you know a heart or you know it's like well I guess they like the shot but I don't know why they like the shot and what did you like about the shot what didn't you like you don't very hard to get feedback unless you just go out and ask for it I guess but the ability to self-critique, and again, I encourage Roxanne Overton, try to find her book on uh, Amazon. Um, it, it outlines, it's, it's like a, it's a schedule that you follow uh, a path. And it, it, makes, it makes a huge difference, at least for me it did, but and the contemplative uh, photography book that she's done as well, and then her, in camera motion shots that she's just got tons of those on Facebook. Um, Her name again? Uh, Roxanne Overton. Roxanne Overton. Overton is one word. And she's on Facebook. Uh, but I, you know, I, from the seventies when I was paying attention to Oligarchie uh, Poisson and uh, Kappa and uh, some of these other greats. Um, you know, I could see that you, you have to think about what you're doing. It's not just all grab shot, you know, snapshot stuff. You, you, you have to pause and think and kind of dig into what's there. And after a while, your eye gets accustomed to spotting these things very quickly. 
uh, that that photo awareness, I think, is is, uh, is a remarkable sensation that we get. We can spot juxtapositions on the fly. You can spot expressions on the fly. You can you can see the pathos. You can see the joy. You can, you know, makes a big difference. Just let it go. You know, do it. Okay. Any others? Hey, Dennis, I just want to say thank you. I loved it. Um, I love what you do with black and white and your shadows. Do you do you lean towards black and white or color these days? Well, uh, I do both and I exploit both. I take a color shot and work it to death and then I convert it to black and white and work it to death again and see what it's going to give me. There are times when I shoot deliberately for black and white. I like that one in Pescadero. Uh, I knew that I was going to come up with a shot reminiscent of a red filter on lens uh, finish. Uh, so having the years of shooting black and white film because that's all I could afford and then developing it myself because that's all I could afford, uh, it, it, it trained me, you could say, uh, to look for these types of things, um, tonal scales, structure. Um, you know, I, I've never had a, a full lesson. I mean, I haven't gone to any schools for photography or any of that kind of thing. It's just all self-taught and then paying attention to what I see in the books and the magazines that I've come across and the work of others, certainly, you know, absolutely. And the critiques from others, absolutely. You know, you learn from all that. Um, so to say that I've never gone to a school, I've probably been to one of the biggest ones in the world, but <laughs> anybody but else? How, how did you do your transition from film to digital? How was that for you and what, what made you do that? Well, I was going on a trip to Europe and uh, in the past when I'd seen 72, I got married and went to Europe on a honeymoon. And I remember the anxiety that I had take, you know, shooting film and not seeing results until I got back to San Francisco and processed them, <laughs> worrying the whole time that the x-rays at the airport would ruin the film. And so when I went back to France, uh, at that time, digital was just coming out. And so I bought an Epson digital camera and took it with me. <laughs> and, you know, it was great because I could take pictures of the of the family because I have a French family over there and immediately share those images with them, not having to wait for those to be developed. Uh, I could email them, you know, so it was a great, you know, I enjoyed it. Uh, and the instant feedback, you know, being able to shoot and look and shoot and look to make sure you got that Eiffel Tower, you got that, you know, because it's a long way from home and to go back, you know, having missed a shot finding out later on 35 millimeter film is no fun so so i took to it like a duck to water i enjoy and i i like technology so it suited me just fine yeah. thank you mm -hmm. certainly thank you for asking anybody else i think we're coming up close to uh, eight o'clock here i'm watching it on the side let's do our photo challenge i'm gonna share the screen okay Blah, blah, blah. So I met with Dennis today and we came up with a really cool photo challenge. And give me one second here. Uh, share screen. Go. Mm -hmm. Want to read that for us, Mr. Dennis? Sure. Okay. Uh, the November photo challenge. Take a photo of a flower with a black background. Use black paper, card, cloth, or anything you have to create a nondescript background so the subject can shine. I showed you this shot in this presentation, and the background for this is a computer monitor that is not turned on, so it's just all dark, <laughs> and it's window ambient side light, so there's no flash. Otherwise, you'd get a big white burst on that monitor, you know. So you, you have to watch out for reflections on a, on a black screen like that. But anyway, the, the whole purpose, and hopefully is can be seen, is illustrative that 
you can eliminate any distraction from behind the subject. And it might be a pretty vase, it might be a, a piece of jewelry, it might be whatever. And mm. so the idea is, you know, using a using a background okay. to, to block out. It's, oh. it pays so not off. just a flower. Pardon? It says take a photo of a flower. Oh, well. How about I change it to take a photo of the subject? Okay. Yeah. How about take a photo of your of a subject? Yeah. Just it could be photo. anything. It could be a take person. A it could be yeah. You know, <laughs> portrait shot. It's done in portraiture. A leaf. Yeah. I got a leaf. <laughs> you got a leaf. Okay. Yeah, that's good. You yeah, I think that'll work fine though. But I have a monitor right over here. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. And it's Great. a lot cleaner than trying to do it in post-processing with masking and all the rest of it. My goodness, oh. that's, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put that up. I'll put that on our Facebook page and I'll put it in our chat in case you want it. Uh, anybody else? Ideas. Stephanie, I just have a question. I I couldn't get in for the first 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So are you recording this? Yes. Great. Yeah, Thanks. I'm really sorry about that. I've been doing a million things all at once this week. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank all of you for tuning in and uh, hearing my stories and seeing my work and offering your comments, mm -hmm. I appreciate it. You can find me on Facebook. Yep. Um, thank you. Keep clicking. Thanks, Dennis. You bet. Thank, thank you. Click on be thank safe, you. you guys. Okay, watch your health. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. This Take should care. be up probably tomorrow morning on Facebook. Okay. Thank you so much. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Again. Remember, no meeting next month, but we'll meet back again in January. And we hope to see you all at the uh, at our show. Oh, cool. Do you want things brought to you like the day before Thanksgiving? Is that correct? No. Do you want them on Wednesday or is there another week in there? No, there's another, there's all, another week after that. Let me, uh, do you want to take a screen? I sent a letter out that um, has the all week the after Thanksgiving. Okay, cool. Um, do you want me to send here? I'll put it in the chat in case you didn't read it. I'm good. I just, I'm, um, cal calendrically challenged. <laughs> I just put it in the chat. Yeah, but you should know these dates. So do you want me to, I put it in the chat so you can write it down. Perfect. Yes. Where? It's not in my chat. It, yeah. It's not in the chat yet. Not there. No. There's an untitled no, document. No, it's not there. Yeah, that's it. The untitled document. Where? I don't have. Oh, do you yeah. see where the chat is? Yeah, I'm on an iPad, sure but I don't see any. Or just look for your old emails from me. Or okay. you know, maybe I'll send it again tomorrow. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Dennis, thank you. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. And everybody else. My pleasure. My yeah, pleasure. thanks. Yeah. Thank thank you. You. Thanks Bye. to you folks, too, for your work. Because I enjoy right. seeing your shots. See you guys later. See you guys soon. Ciao. All right. All right. Good Bye -bye. night, Paul. See you all on the second. Okay. Have fun. Nice. All right. So that concludes.